everyone. I'm Dina. And I'm Charlotte. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit. Welcome. Actually, I meant to ask you, Dina, uh, when we were chatting off mic, but is it snowing on your end of the city? Because it's now snowing on mine. We finally got snow. Oh, I was sitting outside just before this having a cheeky little hoot and uh, me and Buffy were just sat watching the snow come down and it was actually kind of magical. There were some Christmas lights coming from the neighbor's house and uh, it was casting a really nice light on the backyard. It was a it was a moment. It really is nice. I mean, tomorrow morning we're going to have to deal with drivers, but yeah. right now it's beautiful. It It is. It's kind of nice to see. I'm glad... Hopefully, it will stick around a little bit so we can have a white Christmas. We're officially into Winter Wonderland, Alberta, I think. And we are now in December. And speaking of December, this is the last episode of our show before our live show. Yay! So it's coming up this Saturday, Felice Cafe, 7 p.m., our very first live recording of the show. It's going to be a damn good time. I'm very excited and a little nervous, but I'm pretty stoked to see all your smiling faces. It's going to be amazing. I seriously, I can't wait. I know we keep talking about it, but we're going to keep talking about it. We're also going to do our best to get that show up and available for all of you to listen to. We're going to see how that goes. No promises, but we're going to do our best. And uh, yeah, it's going to be amazing. So if you are in the area, get your tickets before they're all gone. We cannot wait to see all of your gorgeous faces. Yes. And as a quick reminder, I know you've heard us say it before, but the theme is film noir. So feel free to dress up in your 1930s, 1940s detective noir inspired outfits. Dina and I will be dressed appropriately. So uh, yeah, feel free to do that too, if you like. Exactly. We honestly, I can't wait. I've seen some uh, photos of what some folks are wearing and I'm I'm stoked. I can't Ooh, wait. But Nice. I have an update for you, and I think you're going to love it. Yeah, I uh, I already know what it is, and I do fucking love it, to be honest. Yes, so I'm going to remind you all of Luis Garavito. We covered him way, way back, episodes 17 to 19, and something about that series, we ended it on kind of an uneasy note because we didn't really know what the fate of Luis Garavito was going to be because there was a chance he was going to be free sometime in 2023, and dear friends... On October 12th of this year, he found that freedom because he died. Yeah, he didn't get to see a day outside of prison. And I'm thankful for that because he had some pretty high and mighty ideas about what he was going to be doing with himself once he was a free man. And I didn't like the sound of any of it. No, and he was a terrible guy, one of the absolute worst. So those of you who don't know his story, I recommend listening to the series. It is truly horrific, but he confessed to killing over 190 children, mostly orphan boys. So pretty huge numbers. The majority of the victims were children from poor and vulnerable families. He took advantage of them. He would dress up as sometimes a pastor. Sometimes he would dress up like a teacher, give them candy money, that kind of stuff. And then he would take them away physically, sexually assault them, and then brutally murder them. And again, he did this over probably 200 times. The true number isn't known. And that's honestly worse, I think. I'm glad he did not see a day of freedom and that he rotted to death in jail. I really quickly want to talk about why this was a huge deal because he had originally been charged with killing 172 children. He was found guilty of only 138 counts of those 172 because they still needed to investigate a whole bunch. And like we talked about in the series, he was sentenced to 1,853 years and nine days. But because Colombian law limited imprisonment to 40 years and because he helped find some of those bodies, his sentence was reduced to 22 years. What did he end up dying of? It was interesting because we talked about it in the series. He was very sick with few different types of cancer, with skin cancer and leukemia. It hasn't fully been released what killed him, but we do know that it was a type of cancer. 
Oh, I see. That makes total sense then. I'm glad. I'm glad. And I hope he was in a lot of pain because that was the least he deserved. Yeah. And I'm really glad that he didn't get out on some kind of a technicality. The thing that made this kind of scary was we saw this happen with another serial killer with a similar victim count, Pedro Lopez. He was released early and then the guy just vanished. Which is a terrifying notion that he could have just been anywhere doing anything, including continue to kill people. And he, just like Luis Garibito, his number was like 300 plus possible victims. Proven yeah. victims was 110. So <laughs> these guys are scary. Like these are not the kind of people you want out roaming about. So I mean, I, I hate to say I'm glad that someone died, but holy shit, I'm glad he died. Hey, wasn't he going to run for some kind of political office when he got out? Wasn't that one of his aspirations? That was the plan. So, oh, I mean, completely God. just no sense of reality whatsoever. Yeah, no thank you. I can't imagine uh, Luis Garavito being, like, the mayor of a small town. Right, and the other thing he talked about was maybe being, like, a teacher or something Ugh. like that. But he had wanted to put himself back in these positions of trust. And that, to me, if that's not a red flag, I mean, come on now. I also think there would have been a lot of vigilante-type folks that would be gunning for him once he got out as well. Oh, yeah, there were many, many people. I mean, when you kill that many people, that's a lot of families that you hurt right there. And that's a lot of people who are probably going to want you dead real quick. Oh, absolutely. He would have probably had to go into some kind of like witness protection, but I don't think he could have hid who he was for too long anyway. Probably for the best that he died in prison, to be honest, on all accounts. Yep, definitely. And we have been seeing a lot of these big name guys kind of dying throughout the last few years, I think of Peter Sutcliffe. Oh, but, yeah. But, you know, we're seeing them go. And uh, I mean, I'm not sad about it. No, honestly, they were taking up space and oxygen. Yep. So I guess we have a conclusion to our Louise Garavito series almost two years later. Yeah. Well, it's uh, I love to see it. On to a slightly, I don't even really know how to explain this, but I saw it on my TikTok travels, as I often do, and that brought me to having to Google the phrase, gay furry hackers. <laughs> Go on. The story here is... <laughs> quite it it i'm dead serious guys this is not a joke <laughs> gay furry hackers breached a nuclear lab to demand cat girl research <laughs> now i'm not being mean by calling them gay furry hackers that is how they refer to themselves their group is called sieged sec and yeah, they are a bunch of gay furry hackers. Actually, they're most well known for recently standing up and using their hacker skills to stand up against the recent ruling on Roe v. Wade in the States. But now they would like some research into cat girls. I must know more. Let me get you some fucking details. <laughs> <laughs> so they breached databases at a nuclear research laboratory in Idaho, and they released thousands of their human resource records, so all of their employee information. And their only ransom demand was, like I said, the lab must begin a cat girl research program. Oh um, my goodness. Yeah, so they're they're fucking with the big dogs here because the Idaho National Laboratory is a government laboratory. They had attacked various other government systems over five states earlier in the year. They again, they took records which contain names, addresses, social security numbers of all these employees. They were definitely confirmed to be authentic. They weren't fucking around. But when Siege Sec gets in touch, like this is how they speak, quote unquote, meow, 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 meow. Whoa, so much crunchy data. <laughs> We're willing to make a deal with INL. If they research creating IRL cat girls, we will take down this post. I wish them well. 
I mean, I guess. I don't really know what they have in mind when we're saying cat girls. Like, are we talking about like Final Fantasy cat girls where it's like human with like the yeah. ears and the tail or like, I don't really know what they want here, but it's kind of interesting that they go from protesting the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which is something, in my opinion, that's quite honorable. And now they've sort of gone off the deep end and they're like, you know what? Cat girls, that's what we want next. Hey, and you know what? I am looking forward to an update on that one because I, too, want to know more about the cat girls. I mean, they're quoted as saying, our motivation for hacking is purely personal. We hack because we can and because it's funny to see our exploits in the news. So... Perhaps they're just going for the attention of it all. I mean, that would be the more logical notion, I suppose. They say often we go after organizations for hacktivist reasons because we see what they are doing in the news and decide that they deserve to be punished, which is coming off as very um, Batman of them Mm -hmm. (laughs) for a group of gay furry hackers targeting nuclear labs in the efforts of cat girls, I guess. I don't really know how to follow up with that. I mean, how do you? There's nothing. I mean, really, you you can talk all day about that and really say nothing. Siege Sec wasn't a group I'd heard of before, but I guess I will be keeping an ear out for them now. I mean, we've all heard of like Anonymous and, and groups like that, but Siege Sec was not what I expected when I heard the phrase gay furry hackers. <laughs> Power to you. Right? I'm excited for uh, for updates there, so keep us posted on the gay yeah. furry hackers. I will definitely try. <laughs> we'll see how they uh, go with the cat girl research. <laughs> I'm going to really dampen the mood with my next one. Oh boy. Well, that's, I suppose, good because my next one is also pretty sad. Oh, well, I mean, that's kind of what we do on this show, hey? Mm-hmm. So I was uh, watching Netflix and I was looking for something new to watch and I found this documentary on the 1982 Alpine Meadows Avalanche. Oh, okay. So I don't know if I was just like super PMSing or it was was (laughs) definitely really sad, but I cried twice watching this. Oh my God. It was sad. Oh my goodness. Okay, so... 40 years ago on March 31st in 1982, a deadly avalanche ripped through Alpine Meadows ski area in California. This area, they'd seen avalanches before, but this was unlike anything they'd ever seen. It buried dozens of people, seven people died, and millions of dollars worth of damages to the resort were caused. Holy shit. uh, It was bad. Yeah, sounds like it. Awful. So... All of this started a few days prior on the 27th. A storm started to roll in and the snow had been just dumping in the area for days and days. And I think it's kind of appropriate that it's snowing right now that we're talking about (laughs) this. So what happened was the way that they would control the avalanches in this area was they would use a lot of like dynamite and things like that Mm -hmm. in order to cause avalanches controlled avalanches and right. we talked about this when we covered day out Love's pass yeah yeah of course so eight hours before this happened and four days since the start of the storm they got nearly 90 inches total of snow holy shit that's that's a lot of the white stuff <laughs> yeah it was really bad so they closed the resort luckily there weren't really a lot of people there but there were some staff members that stayed behind and all of a sudden the side of the mountain just began to move oh god so a 3200 foot long slide began to come down towards them. Jesus Christ. And this covered about 700 vertical feet in a matter of seconds as it hurled towards the base where the resort was. And this was huge. Like, it flattened trees like they were nothing. Like, it came right towards them and it buried the resort and all of the people that were still in it in a huge pile of snow. Frick, this is an absolute nightmare. I can't even imagine how horrifying this would be. The beginning of this story was definitely giving me sort of 
Shining vibes, like very Stephen King. But now it's just giving me full on avalanche horror movie. Everyone's buried alive. The thing that I think I forget when I think about avalanches is this happens in a matter of seconds. By the time you even hear it coming, because you will hear it coming, an avalanche is incredibly loud. It's like thunder. You're covered in it. So, you know, there's no running away. Like, it comes so fast. There were some survivors, luckily. Uh, One of them was a man named Randy Buck, who was in the main lodge at the time. He basically recalled a giant whoosh And then being buried in a pile of snow, he kind of rolled up into a ball and it swept him away. He miraculously found a pocket of air and was able to eventually free his head and his arms and then climb up to the surface. When he climbed up, he saw that everything was gone and he immediately went into rescue mode. I'm not particularly claustrophobic, but the idea of being buried in snow like that just makes my heart rate skyrocket. (laughs) It's buried alive. Like, just the idea of that. And then also you're cold. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Like, this to me and someone in this story does end up buried alive. We're going to talk about that in a second. But uh, before we get to that, we have another survivor, Tad DeFelice, who was buried next to Randy Buck. He was able to free himself too, and they went over and started searching for people. Eventually, search and rescue teams were alerted, and about 150 people showed up to start looking for survivors. And they had to dig through giant chunks of ice, giant piles of snow, rubble, concrete from the buildings. It was a huge ordeal just to try to get down and see where these people were. Yeah, and this snow is not melting anytime soon. (laughs) No, I mean, it's cold. It's still snowing. It is terrible. What time of year was this, did you say? This was in late March. Okay, so still to a point where it's still getting fairly dark early in the evening, you know, as well. So and in the mountains, you don't have nearly as much daylight as you do outside of the mountains. So there's that sort of adversary as well. It's really unfortunate. And I mean, the lucky thing is quite a few of these people, they were very experienced skiers. They were the ones that were, you know, blasting off the dynamite to do these controlled avalanches. But there were three out-of-towners, Dr. Leroy Nelson, his daughter, and David Hahn. They were stuck in like a vacation home for a few days while it had been snowing and they had gotten frustrated and they decided that they were just going to get out and leave and go to the restaurant that was at the resort they Mm -hmm. showed up and all of a sudden the avalanche happened and they were buried under 10 feet of snow that covered the parking lot holy shit the manager of the resort bernie kangaree he was in the main lodge when the avalanche happened he was buried but unfortunately he did not survive oh poor guy holy shit And that is when they started to realize that uh, there were quite a few folks who hadn't survived. That's insane. It honestly, like the hopelessness of realizing that people had not survived was so sad because they talk about it when they interview the survivors. It's all of a sudden you're talking to someone, they're right in front of you. And then in a split second, they're gone, but you're not. I can't imagine the survivor's guilt from something like that. And it's something that is completely out of your control. The fact that you survived it all is sheer luck. That's it. That's all it is, is you were not standing in that one particular spot. And because of that, you are alive insane luck. And one last person I want to talk about that they focused on a lot in this documentary was a woman named Anna Conrad, who was buried alive for five days after the avalanche. Oh, God. So she was in the employee locker rooms with her boyfriend. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) When the avalanche happened, she was forced under a bench and a wall fell on top of her. But because she was under this bench, she didn't get crushed. Oh, shit. For 
five days, she survived by eating snow and mud. She would later say she spent a lot of time sleeping and thinking about her friends and talking to herself in a positive way. They would not tell her that her boyfriend did not survive until a few days after they found her when they knew that she would be able to handle it. Wow. Oh, my God. I... I don't know that I would have had the mental fortitude to survive. The fact that she didn't go into extreme panic and shock is absolutely amazing. But I can definitely understand why they waited to inform her that he had passed. The one kind of, I guess, glimmering light of hope in this story that I thought was nice. And this is what one of the things that made me cry, I'm not going to lie to you, was they talked about the dog, Bridget, who found her. She was a rescue dog. Um, And Bridget was the first search and rescue dog in North America to find a live human in an avalanche. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah, and so they talked about what a good girl she was and they showed her and she was like getting all this praise and reward and I'm just like PMSing and watching this and just bawling my (laughs) eyes out. Like, oh my God. Uh, Oh my God. Oh, it was so sweet. And uh, as for Anna, she spent the next few months in the hospital. She lost a portion of her right leg and she lost the toes on her left foot to frostbite. But this happened in March. And by December of that year, Anna was skiing again. Holy shit, that's amazing. She now works in the community. She teaches avalanche safety and works as an ambassador at another resort. The fact that she was even able to go back to that environment again and not be extremely traumatized is quite frankly stunning. Like, that's amazing. Because I don't know that I would have ever gone into the mountains ever again. (laughs) No, right? Like, I'd be like, okay, I'm never going to look at snow again. Goodbye. Yeah, Mother Nature clearly doesn't want me here. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. I just, I love the story. I thought that it was, it wasn't really what I would normally watch, but, uh, Definitely just a reminder that Mother Nature is horrifying, she is relentless, and if she wants to, she will get you and she will end you. Next, we're going to go from the snowy mountains to sunny Australia, specifically Victoria, Australia. Some of you guys may have heard this already, and I couldn't actually remember if I had talked about this on Extra Credit or not. But either way, I will give you guys a recap and a update because there has been an update since the story first came out. So Erin Patterson, I believe 49 years old, has been charged with three murders and two attempted murders by poisoning her relatives with deadly death cap mushrooms. She claims that it was not her, that it was not what she intended, that it was all an accident. No one, including the police, is really falling for that. There's a lot of suspicions around it. She was instantly suspected when her family got sick after eating the beef wellington that she had prepared for them, but she and her two kids did not get sick at all. Death cap mushrooms are one of the most poisonous mushrooms out there, and the death that you will suffer from eating them is not a nice one. (laughs) Oh my goodness, that's an evil way to kill somebody. Now, I have to ask, what was her name again? Erin Patterson. I have to, I need to know what she looks like. I mean, she just looks like a mom, I guess. Apparently, the the victims in this particular case were Dawn and Gail Patterson, both 70 years old. They were her former in-laws. In-laws? <laughs> in-laws. <laughs> Heather Wilkinson, who was 66 years old, was Gail's sister. Ian Wilkinson, who was 69, was Heather's husband who got very sick, but he did recover, but not after like two months in the hospital. And 
I believe a significant part of that time was spent in a coma. And another 48-year-old man whose name um, they do not say, but he is widely believed to be Simon Patterson, Aaron's estranged husband. He became ill after three other meals dating back to 2021, which is also very suspicious. I do not like that when you Google her name, it is just pictures of her like looking like she's crying, but there doesn't look like there's any tears. I've been reading up on this for a little while now. This all took place on July 29th, I believe, of 2023. She is still maintaining that she did not do this, that it was an accident or that she does not know how it happened. The theory is, is that she wanted to try and get her estranged husband to come back. And the idea was that he, she was going to win them all over. And then when it became apparent that he had absolutely no intentions of getting back with her, that she then poisoned all of them. I hate her. Oh my God. Right? It's so vindictive. And it's like, just let him go. Why do you have to take everybody else out with you? I guess she talked to the police recently and I found a quote, if you don't mind me sharing it. Oh no, please do. Please do. So she said this to the police. I am now wanting to clear up the record because I have become extremely stressed and overwhelmed by the deaths of my loved ones. I am hoping this statement might help in some way. I believe if people understood the background more, they would not be so quick to rush to judgment. I am devastated to think that these mushrooms may have contributed to the illness suffered by my loved ones. I really want to repeat that I had absolutely no reason to hurt these people whom I loved. I don't know about that. She prepared her beef wellington with a mix of mushrooms from like the local grocery store and some dried mushrooms she got from an Asian grocery store. The dish features like beef tenderloin in like a puffed pastry with mushrooms and whatnot. So yeah, she included these mushrooms. Death cat mushrooms are extremely poisonous. Consuming just one mushroom can kill an adult human being. Symptoms include violent stomach pains, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and basically it does so much damage to your liver that you can't survive. Ooh, a rough way to go. And the shitty thing is, after the initial symptoms of the stomach pains, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you seem to get better, and then for 72 hours, you get significantly worse until basically you die. Oh, man. Oh, that's just like, what a terrible way to, like, if, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it. If you're going to kill someone, kill them quickly, at least. Like, I feel like that is just like, you're torturing them at that point realistically why do you have to go after everybody did your great or did your auntie-in-law do anything to you i don't think so let it go this is the father of your children for god's sakes right like i understand some people really can't handle rejection but uh, you didn't have to drag everyone else into it lady No kidding. But either way, she has been charged with murder. We will wait to see how her trial and everything goes. Her committal mention hearing has been set for May 3rd. So I guess we'll be waiting for a few months to see what happens here. I think it's going to be fairly sensationalized. The whole of Australia was like, what the fuck is happening when it first happened? So we will have to wait and see how her trial goes. I would love to know more because, I mean, I want to see if they're going to try the insanity plea or what's going to happen here because she just doesn't seem like she's got uh, a full sense of what's going on. I don't. Yeah, I'd be curious to see. And I'm not too sure about how the laws operate in Australia, because for all intents and purposes, you may not be able to even do an insanity plea in Australia. I'm not entirely sure. So. Yeah, I guess we will wait to see. I will update everybody when I hear about it. Please do. (laughs) All right. And that brings us to the part of the episode where we talk about another strange and unusual death. I've had a sneak peek into who we're talking about this week, so I'm excited to hear about it. We're taking it way, 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 way back to the year 455 BC. Wow. And we're going to talk about a fella named Aeschylus. Now, Aeschylus had heard of a prophecy that he was going to be killed 
on this specific day by the fall of a house. And so he decided, well, okay, well, I'm just not going to go and stand in a house. I'm going to go outside. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. As he's standing outside, he was killed by a tortoise that was dropped by an eagle that thought that his bald head was a rock that would shatter the shell of the tortoise. Oh, my God. And that was... What are the chances? (laughs) And that was the end of Aeschylus. He has to be the only human being in history that has been killed by someone dropping a tortoise on him. Right? Or killed because someone thought your head was a rock. Wow. That would lead for a savage eulogy, I suppose. Can you imagine? I wasn't bald. Well, yes, you were, sir. Yes, you were. I just, oh my goodness, I saw this story and I was like, this poor guy, he was like, well, okay, if a house isn't going to kill me, I won't stand near a house. And then he got killed by a tortoise flying from the sky. In that sense, he got killed by the tortoise's house. (laughs) (laughs) No one said it had to be his house. Oh my God, I love it. Oh man, what a way to go. Death by tortoise. Rest in peace, Aeschylus. Rest in peace. All righty. Well, we are here at the end of the episode. Thank you so much for listening this week, guys. Like we said, we will do our best to get our live show episode out as soon as possible. I'm really hoping for Sunday, but I will let you know if that ends up being delayed. We will see how it goes. If you are in the Edmonton area, make sure you come on out to Felice Cafe on December 9th. We are going to be performing like we've mentioned a million times before, but we would love to see your beautiful faces. And tickets for the show are only $10. It's all going to charity. It's going to be a great time. So get those booties out there. Heck yeah. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. This has been The Grim Curriculum. Extra Extra credit. credit.